thank you, Kishore, for this interview. Now, I think it was Freud that said that uh, one needs to go back to one's childhood to mm. understand a man or a woman. Mm. There, were there any childhood experiences, significant events that you feel perhaps did shape you? I recall you had a difficult childhood. Well, I definitely had a very challenging uh, childhood. And uh, I remember looking back, I mean, what happened was that my parents uh, separated, my father went to jail, he got uh, gambling debts, and uh, debt collectors would come to our house to try and collect money from us, to sell the furniture in our house. So it was a very challenging, uh, I guess, uh, almost Dickensian uh, childhood. But it, uh, the irony of it all now is that now that I'm 67 years old, I look back on my childhood and I realize that I was given a huge competitive advantage by being given a very challenging childhood because it made me very tough. Because when I watched my mother, when she was under great stress, when she had no money <laughs> to sometimes buy food, and she didn't break down. So she taught me a very powerful lesson. Never break down. So that's the great advantage uh, of a challenging childhood because you realize that no, in my life, no matter what challenge I face, nothing can match the challenge that my mother faced when she brought me up. So she taught me to be tough, and that's a huge competitive advantage. Uh, having such a poor, uh, uh, difficult childhood, and you were poor, um, what motivated you then, say, in school? I enjoyed studying, and I especially enjoyed reading. The one institution that saved my life, literally, uh, was the Juchat Public Library. And I would go there every week and borrow several books uh, without any instruction from my mother. But I did it because I loved books and I loved reading. And as a result of reading a lot, uh, I began to do very well uh, in my examination. So it was basically not uh, any forces pushing me uh, to do well. Uh, it was the love of learning that drew me into books. And books brought you to a whole new world. And you did very well in school. And uh, you, in fact, uh, was a, a president scholar. The year was 1967, was it? Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned the uh, president scholarship because, frankly, when I finished uh, grade 12 or pre-university, as it was called then, my destiny uh, as the son of a Sindhi was to go and sell textiles on High Street. And in fact, that's exactly what I did. When I finished my A-levels at St. Andrew's School, I went straight to work in High Street and I was earning $150 a month as a salesman. And then out of the blue, and I don't know how it happened, uh, I got an offer of the President's Scholarship, which paid me $250 a month. So my mother was very pragmatic, said, well, the President's Scholarship gives you $250 a month. Cindy sales for hundred dollars a month. Go, go to university. You get more money. I had a wonderful time. The four years uh, at the Bukit Timah campus were four of the happiest years of my life, because I actually discovered that I had a passion for studying philosophy. And that's why I had to repeat a year. I gave up economics. I gave up sociology. I gave up what were considered practical subjects to study a subject that was completely impractical, which was philosophy. And it was one of the wisest decisions that I ever made in my life because when you are passionately in love with a subject, you excel in it. And so I, and I had a good fortune of having several remarkable teachers, you know, in this small philosophy department. But what drew you to philosophy? Well, the, the, the way I explain it is very simple. When I went for the economics department tutorial, uh, my professor then was not interested in argument. He only wanted to know what's the right answer. 
And so if you give the right answer, you're okay. And there was no debate, no discussion. Whereas by contrast, the philosophy department was the exact opposite, where there was no right answer. And there's no such thing as a right answer in philosophy. So what you do is you debate the pros and cons uh, of each argument, and then you weigh and decide as a matter of judgment which position uh, is the correct position. So it was uh, so liberating uh, to be forced to think of alternative uh, answers all the time because there's no such thing as the right answer uh, in the philosophy department. So you moved on and uh, your first job was with the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Mm. Can you describe your early years? You know, I, uh, I mean, I'm not giving a big secret away if I say that I happen to be a radical on campus. And I was editor of the uh, Singapore undergrad, and in fact, wrote an editorial called A Question of Decorum, which has been published in my book, Can Singapore Survive Now? in which I was very critical uh, of the then Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. So when I graduated, I assumed that I would only spend a couple of years in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and then, frankly, resign and go and do a master's and PhD and become a full-time philosopher. That was the goal I had when I left uh, uh, university in 1971. But what happened was that after two years of working, including one year in Cambodia, I ended up uh, going to, st after three years of working, I ended up uh, studying philosophy at Dalhousie University in Canada. And that one year of graduate studies taught me a very valuable lesson, which is that politicking in academia is actually worse than politicking in the bureaucracy of the Singapore government. So surprisingly, I look at, when I could compare the two finally, I realized that actually the foreign ministry had a far less politicized environment than academia, and I wouldn't, wasn't such a bad job to go back to foreign, foreign affairs. Your career as a diplomat, you must have met many personages. Do you care to comment on uh, they need not be politicians. Do you care to comment on one or two personages somehow that, who left a very a deep impression on you for one reason or another? Well, I would say the, the three people who had the most profound impact on me uh, intellectually and also, uh, I guess in some ways emotionally, were the three great founding leaders of Singapore. Uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Dr. Go King Sui, and Mr. S. Rajaratnam. And looking back now, I realize it was, a, it was one of the biggest privileges of my life that I worked with all three of them. Because all three were remarkably great men. And from each one of them, I learned different things. And, uh, you know, as, as it, is, it is now clear that the caliber of the founding leaders of Singapore uh, is as high or as great as the caliber of the founding leaders of America. Okay. In retrospect, you can see that very clearly. Mm -hmm. So when you work closely with remarkable men, you learn so much, you know, you absorb so much. Can you mention one lesson from Mr. Lee Kuan Yew that, uh, that stayed with you? Well, you know, um, I actually came out, uh, you know, since I'm a dean of uh, a school of public policy, which is fortunately named after Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, uh, I, just, I actually came out with my own theory of uh, leadership. And I say a good leader has five C's. And I think Mr. Lee Kuan Yew exemplified this because he had these five C's uh, of the theory. And the five C's are number one, compassion which means that whatever Mr. Lee Kuan Yew tried to do, he was trying to help other people. Moral compassion. Number two, he was very cunning. He could out-negotiate anybody. That was amazing. Number three, he was a collector of talent. He surrounded himself not with fools, 
but were people who were as brilliant as he was. And certainly Dr. Goh Keng Sui was in every respect intellectually as brilliant uh, as Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, he uh, showed uh, a great deal of courage uh, and great fortitude. The fifth C is complexity. Com because in today we live in a world where the world is becoming more and more complex. And you have to have a remarkably high IQ to deal with this complex world. And that capacity to handle complexity is another aspect of a great leader. And, and Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, by the way, had all these five attributes in a remarkable way. Um, I guess when it comes to Dr. Goh Keng Sui, I mean, um uh, the, there's also this, this the, the five C's uh, in, in different degrees. I'm curious about uh, Rajaratnam, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, mm. um, uh, whom I seem to feel when I was in MFA was in a world of his own. You know, can you say um, you dealt with him uh, far more intimately than I did? Um, would you like to say something about uh, about Raja the man, well, his character? I, 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 you know, uh, Mr. Raja Ratnam has sometimes been described as a lion of Singapore. And I think it's a description that fits him very well because he was one of the bravest men I ever met in my life. And I saw this at first hand uh, when we went to Havana, Cuba in 1979 to attend the Non-Aligned Summit meeting. And as you know, at that time, there was a Cold War and the Soviet Union had supported the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia. United States had opposed the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia. And as you know, Singapore and the ASEAN states had also opposed the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia. But we went to, when he we went to Cuba, we went to a country that was a friend of Vietnam, a friend of the Soviet Union. And at that point in time, Cambodia was still being represented by the previous government, the Khmer Rouge government of Pol Pot, which Vietnam had removed. So the Vietnamese wanted the non-aligned movement to recognize the Quisling government that they had installed in Phnom Penh, which was against international law. So we had to fight the Soviet forces down there. So Fidel Castro was very cunning, the leader of Cuba. He convened a small meeting in a room where he stacked the room with leaders, presidents, prime ministers who were all friends of the Soviet Union in that room. And the opposite side, there were only two people, the president of Sri Lanka and the foreign minister of Singapore. So the odds were stacked against Mr. Rajaratnam. The atmosphere was very intimidating. And frankly, if, if Mr. Rajaratnam had any uh, uh, sense of cowardice, he would have melted. He did the exact opposite. He fought like a lion. And even though he was a foreign minister, so much more junior to these presidents and prime ministers, he didn't give an inch. He just fought them ferociously, single-handedly, without even the support of Sri Lanka. And I saw that with my own eyes. And I said, this is a man I want to be like when I grow up. Moving from Singapore, um, I believe that you had spent some time, several hours with Jokowi, uh, uh, now, now president of, uh, of Indonesia. Um, did, were you impressed by him? Um, how did you find him? I was invited one December, maybe two years ago, I suspect, uh, to go and spend a few hours with then Governor Jokowi of Jakarta. And uh, what happened was that we traveled together in a car where he and I sat at the back and the driver sat in front and another friend sat in front. So I was able to spend five, six hours talking to him. And I was very impressed by him. Because number one, the man is completely honest, amazingly honest. Number two, completely dedicated to improving the lives of other people. Number three, very pragmatic, very shrewd. 
and very willing to learn. So in the car, he asked me questions about what did Singapore do, how did Singapore solve this problem, and so on and so forth. So I was extremely uh, hopeful when he became the president. But he's had a very rough time in his first year or so because he's discovered that even though he's the president of Indonesia, uh, because he doesn't have a political party that controls the parliament, and he doesn't even control his own political party, he has a big challenge uh, on his hands. And he made me aware that to state an, a remarkable truism, politics is about politics. So if you want to be a politician, you've got to get your politics right. And you've got to win enough support in parliament before you can get your programs through. That's interesting. So, do you think from your years as a diplomat, uh, from your, your years uh, as, as a student and the people you have met, um, and your travels, is there such a thing as an Asian style of leadership or an ASEAN style of leadership? Well, I, I don't know whether there is an Asian style or Western style of leadership. But you know, when I mentioned my five C's, uh, theory of leadership, there's actually a sixth C that is equally important. And that's not, a lead, that's not the attributes that I spoke about, the five C's. But the sixth C is context. So for I give you a very obvious, glaring example, Mahatma Gandhi was a great leader of India. He helped to bring out uh, bring about the independence of India. Now, Mahatma Gandhi could, was very successful in the Indian context, but he would have completely failed in the Chinese context. By contrast, Mao Zedong was very successful as a strong leader in the Chinese context, but he would have failed in the Indian context. So, leadership is not an abstract thing, uh, success in leadership depends on how you adapt to your context. So if you take Singapore, for example, right? Singapore had a very strong set of leaders. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, Dr. Go King Sui, Mr. Raja Ratnam, Mr. Lim Kim San, Dr. To Chin Chai, and so on and so forth. And they were appropriate for that context. But in Singapore today, the political context has changed. So when the political context changes, you have to have a different kind of leaders uh, to emerge to. So leadership is not something that you can take an automatic formula and say, hey, Bill Clinton was so successful in America. Let's just take him to China. <laughs> Sorry. Bill Clinton will fail in China. So it's, the context is, is very important. And the great leaders are those who understand their context very well, understand the limitations, and are able to rise above those limitations. Apart from the courage that uh, you've mentioned that our early leaders had, have you seen examples of um, moral courage in other personages? Well, there's one leader, uh, unfortunately, whom I never met in person, whom I regard as the greatest leader of the 20th century, and that was Deng Xiaoping. Because Deng Xiaoping was by far the greatest leader of the 20th century, because he lifted more people out of poverty, which by the way is the most degrading human condition, which I experienced myself as a child. And he lifted more people out of poverty than any human being at any point in history had ever done which is amazing, right? But he had to be a very strong leader to do that. And you know, in the West, he's universally condemned for putting down the student demonstrations in Tiananmen, right? Mm -hmm. Condemned. But what was his choice? If he had allowed the demonstrations to carry on, if the political system of China had crumbled, more people would have suffered. So the big lesson you learn from people like Deng Xiaoping is that life is never a choice. 
between good and evil. If it was that simple, life would be very easy. It's always a choice between the lesser evil in many, many cases. And he chose what he thought was the lesser evil because at the end of the day, by retaining the firm control of China, the Chinese people continue to flourish and do well. Now, what I've just said to you is completely unacceptable to say in an American campus. If what I said to you today was said in an American campus, I would be lynched immediately. But at the same time, this is the kind of, uh, to use one of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's favorite expressions, this is the kind of political hard truth you cannot deny. And do you think uh, Xi Jinping is also, in a way, rather like uh, Deng Xiaoping, having to make very uh, tough decisions? I have great respect for, for Xi Jinping. In fact, in my view, today, uh, in the world today, the four of the greatest leaders in the world today are, I would say, Pope Francis, Angela Merkel, Narendra Modi, and Xi Jinping. And what's interesting, two of the four are Asian. That's quite remarkable. When you consider in the past, all the great leaders used to come from the West. But today, uh, you see more and more strong uh, Asian leaders emerging. And the fact that the two most populous countries in the world, China and India, have strong leaders, provides room for great hope, you know, for the world. Because if the two of the most populous countries in the world manage their affairs well, we are actually going to have a happier century. Now, by the way, when I say a happier century, that's completely taboo in the West also. Because in the West, they all think that the world is getting darker and darker and more dismal and more dangerous. And that's completely wrong. So, uh, so in some ways, paradoxically, uh, you have to, in the past, you used to go to the West for optimism. Today, if you want optimism, come to Asia. I'm intrigued that you included uh, Modi. Um, so you think he's a strong leader? Mm. How so? He is very driven. Mm -hmm. He is convinced that India's potential is far greater than what it is today. And he is determined to try and achieve that potential. And he's, he's very careful and very pragmatic uh, in the changes uh, that he's making. He's reducing subsidies. He's reduced fuel subsidies. He's told the middle class population of India, you are getting subsidies to buy gas tanks. You don't need the subsidies. Please voluntarily give up the subsidies. And four million people voluntarily give up the subsidies so the same gas tank could be transferred to a poor home in India. And in now, he's carrying out a very bold move, taking advantage of the new identity card system of India, which is amazing. They have signed up hundreds of millions of people and given them identity cards. With those identity cards, they can set up bank accounts. With those bank accounts, the subsidy can go direct to the person, and nobody can steal it on the way, which used to happen in the past in India. So that's an example of the enormous changes uh, uh, that he's making. And uh, by the way, I'm aware that Modi is criticized a great deal. Uh, I have met many of his detractors, uh, but I would say on balance, what he's trying to do is trying to modernize India successfully. And you could sense his compassion, uh, one of your five, six Cs, um, in what he does as well as in his communication. Does it mean that a, a good leader, a strong leader, somehow really needs to communicate to his people what it is that he wants yeah. to achieve? 
three things to note about Narendra Modi. He's not doing it for himself. He's absolutely uncorrupt. He has virtually no possessions. He's doing it for the people. Number two, he's probably one of the best communicators in the world. When he gives a speech in Hindi, he's one of the best speakers in the entire world. And thirdly, I think he also has uh, a lot of courage. Uh, he's willing to keep fighting on, even under, against uh, great odds. So, I mean, is, by the way, it is conceivable that he may not succeed. It's conceivable. It happens, right? But uh, if I was a betting man, I would bet that he's going to succeed. Do you think you will ever go into politics, Kishore? Uh, Do you want to be a politician well, so that you could influence policies? Yeah, well, I think if I was uh, 30 years younger, <laughs> uh, I could have gone into politics. But now at the age of 67, uh, I think the, uh, the great thing about writing a lot is that I found that the footprint of my writings is growing larger and larger. So quite often when I travel around the world, uh, I'll meet people in all kinds of interesting corners who will say, yeah, well, yeah my professor made me read your uh, essays, you know. So it happened to me in Serbia, it happened to me in Canada, and it's happened to me in uh, Argentina. So, I mean, that's, that's remarkable. You tell me that you are happiest when you're writing. Mm. And I know you're a very disciplined person. You will lock yourself up in a room and, and write. And it, you obviously have tremendous personal satisfaction from writing. But, but, but what's your motivation? Well, my motivation is to create a better world. I actually believe that we can create a better world. But uh, I, to be completely honest with you, uh, one great mission that I have is that for the last 200 years, the flow of ideas has been a one-way street. It has been from the West to the rest. I want to create, for the first time in 200 years, a two-way street of ideas. We should continue to learn from the West, but I also want the West to learn from the rest. And to my absolute surprise, one of the biggest intellectual surprises that I've encountered in my life is that in theory, the most open mind is supposed to be that of a Western liberal intellectual. Because liberals, by definition, are open to all ideas and will consider every possibility. But in practice, I have discovered that the mental vision of a Western liberal intellectual is very narrow. He cannot conceive of a world where his ideas may be wrong. So I, the narrow-mindedness of this creature called the Western liberal intellectual has been a huge discovery for me. And unfortunately, there are many Singaporeans, including those in our media. When I read what some of our journalists in Singapore say, they polish the boots of these Western liberal intellectuals. I will wrap up the interview by asking you, Kishore, have you ever thought of an epitaph for yourself? Uh, I don't wish to be morbid, but what shall we say? Herein lies Kishore, a devoted father, a faithful friend. What would you like your epitaph to be? Uh, well, it's very f uh, five simple words. Uh, uh, he made the world a better place. With that, mm -hmm. thank you, Kishore. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.